things that are outside of God's plan don't allow it to happen. All right for that. Amen. This is my introduction to you. God bless you. So let's get to the Word of God on today. I want to introduce my message to you today. And this is the second part of Spirit to Spirit. I'm so thankful that uh, you tune in to, you know, enjoy this uh, uh, this series. Uh, it's called Spirit to Spirit. So today we're going to be talking about Spirit to Spirit. And I do have some scriptures in mind for you. So if you will now, just um, turn to Genesis uh, chapter number 3. And uh, we're going to uh, begin our reading right there, if you will. I'm just going to take a minute and, and get my Bible, if you don't mind. All right, here we go. And I have to find my scripture as well. So if you've got to go in the room and get the Bible, that's all right. We've got time. Hallelujah. Amen. Genesis chapter number 3. We're talking about spirit to spirit. I want to give you this foundational scripture before we really get into the teaching here. And I want to go down to... Well, let's look at chapter 3 and begin with verse number uh, 1 and read down to about verse number 15. So it's about 15 verses. I believe it'll be all right. Well, Prophetess Carter, my lovely wife, you should read that. I appreciate it. Thank you, dear love. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten from the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. All right, amen. Thank you for that word. Awesome word. Isn't that awesome? Hallelujah. We have the story of what took place in the very beginning. And today I want us to really visit this story in a way to give us some insight. We're talking about spirit to spirit. And I want you to understand that, you know, God communicates with us by his spirit. And he communicates to us with our spirit. We are spirit, we're soul, we're body. So we do have a spirit. So God does communicate by spirit. But I also want you to know that there is also another spirit present. Even though God is spirit, there's another spirit present. And that spirit is the spirit of the devil. 
of the spirit of the Antichrist, or Satan himself, or Lucifer, or however you want to address him. And we see him here at work in the garden. This beautiful garden that God had made for the man and his wife, everything was so in order, everything was so in place, and here comes something to mess that plan up. Isn't that just how things go sometimes when things are going well and going great? It looks like it's just too good to be true. Have you ever said that yourself? This is too good to be true. Well, it's time to stop saying that because the gospel is good news and everything God does is good. There only is one thing wrong and that is Satan will show up to try to turn the goodness of God into something other than what God intended for it to be. And here, this is what happened. As we see in the garden, as the man and as his wife was going about doing the daily bidding and doing the work of God, along comes the serpent. Well, I got news for you. This serpent wasn't just a serpent by himself, but there was another spirit present. You know, he was just wise. He might have been, you know, beautiful, and he was able to beguile, and he was more crafty than any of the beasts of the field. But there was another spirit present other than the spirit of the Lord, and other than Adam, and other than Eve. And this is the spirit of the devil. And that is what the devil does. He tries to get into the things that God has made and created for man to try to bring man down, to cause man to lose what God has done. Well, we want to do something about that today. I want to expose what the devil has done and what he is still trying to do. That is the reason why I want to introduce this teaching to you, spirit to spirit, to allow you to know that not only is God a spirit, but there is another spirit that's at work in the world and it's called the spirit of the devil or the enemy or the spirit that's at work against you, contrary to what God has done. Everything God's done is good, it's beautiful. But there comes a spirit that will try the very creative work of Almighty God. Look at what the devil did through this serpent. Look at what he did to this man and to this woman. Well, see the reaction of what a spirit can do. So you think that a spirit is harmless, a spirit is just something that's like vapor or something that doesn't have any substance? Well, the spirit can hear. The Spirit can say, it can speak. The Spirit is a force. And it can get into a person's ear and cause them to do what it said. Even with Eve, she said, this Spirit beguiled me. It beguiled me. So it took her attention away from the things of God. Isn't that a shame how that the devil can take people's attention away from the things of God? You are a spirit. You are a spirit. And what happened here, and I'm you know, not going to get too far ahead of my story, but this is the foundation, and I know we all are full, you know, familiar with creation. So as a result of what they did, Adam's actions caused man, spirit, to die or to be separated from God. So now here they are, separated from God, and every man born after Adam is falling into the same category, separated from God. And that was not God's intention. The spirit of the enemy is always seeking out to destroy God's plan. In the gospel, according to John 10.10, 10, the Bible says the enemy is coming to seek, to kill, and to destroy. Let's turn to that now. I don't need to rush through. I want to take my time. So, because I want you all to get this. I'm tired of the devil getting away with stuff. And uh, it's about time for us to put an end to his vicious works, his diabolical plans that he has in mind to try to deceive you. But I'm here today to throw his card over. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, I want you to help me as well. Turn the devil's apple card over. Since a lot of these pictures are about apples, you know, and people think that this was a real apple, but this is more than an apple experience here. So let's, let's, let's consider, let's look at John 10.10. 10. Now I want you to see the devil's whole plan is exposed by Jesus in the garden. Here, here it is in John 10.10. 10. All right, I'm going to turn these pages here for some reason. 
they didn't want to turn, but that's all right. The word is still here, and I know what the word says. The Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse number 10. So let's look down at verse number 10. Hallelujah, God. Amen. We'll be there in just a second. All right. All right. The thief cometh not only to steal. And see, that was what the devil did. He came to steal what God had given Adam and Eve. He came to steal. And, and then it says to kill. And he came to kill or to cut their relationship off with God or to kill their relationship that God had with him and destroy. And he came to destroy, to make for certain that it, it will not be able to continue to work the way God intended for it to work. So this is the plan of the enemy. So I want you to understand, you've got to understand the enemy's plan. The enemy wants uh, to, to deceive people, but he don't want you to know he's doing that. He wants you to think that he's nice and he's kind and think that what he's doing to you is something that you desire, something that you want or the best thing for you. That's how he deceived uh, our, 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 our first parents here, you know, after the flesh. But he deceived them and spiritually it caused something to happen. You know, he killed their relationship with God. He absolutely annihilated their relationship with God. And that's a terrible thing for the enemy to do and to get away with. He caused them, and someone said he caused them to, to commit high treason. Or that means he went against God's plan for their lives. God's intended will for them was destroyed. Because now the devil himself had become their father. Isn't that something to say? Because their spirit had been cut off from God's spirit. So all the darkness and all the sin and all the diabolical forces of the devil, now the devil had them on his side. Let's go to Ephesians. I want you to see this. Ephesians chapter 2. I want you to see this. Yes, I want to take my time, so bear along with me in patience. You know, in patience. All righty. Ephesians chapter 2. All right, here we go. Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in trespasses and sins. You were dead in trespasses and sins. In which you once walked. Because of Adam's sin, we were born in a shape of sin and iniquity. And we were sinners. And let's, let's see, let, follow that. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit, there it is right there. Satan is a spirit. He's a spirit, I'm trying to tell you that. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So his whole intention was to commit, uh, get Adam and Eve to commit the act of disobedience. And if they had remained in the act of disobedience, they would have been forever lost. Their spirits would have been forever cut off from God. But that was devil's, the devil's plan to destroy God in their lives. And that's his plan to try to destroy God in our lives or to try to destroy God in your life. The part of you, your spirit part, the God part, you know, when God made man, he took a part of himself. And the Bible says he created that part of himself. And then he shaped it and put form on it. When he put form on it, he covered it with the dust of the earth. And now he says, this is man. So the part of God, the part of himself, Adam caused the devil, the devil, the devil caused Adam to destroy the God part of himself. And that's his only intention, is to try to get God out of our lives. Now, you know that's awful. You are a spirit, but you've got to be able to know and discern when the devil is at work. He is trying his best to destroy you. You cannot allow that to happen. You cannot allow the devil to lead you further into sin or degradation or into disobedience. 
the enemy will try his best to take control of your flesh by killing your spirit or keeping you in a dead state away from God. And if he can do that, then he will control your flesh. And your flesh is your physical part that's able to have a, a physical presence in this earth realm. The part of you that can touch, that can see, that can feel, that can smell is what the devil wants to control. And if he gets your spirit, then he's got your body. And that's not how God intended for it to be. He did not intend for the devil to control you. He did not intend for the devil to become your father. On one instance, Jesus told him those religious disciples of his, you know, he said, look, he said, you cannot allow the devil to be your father. In so many words, in essence, is the devil cannot control you. He says, Satan has nothing in me. And that's how we need to learn how to address these matters. And when we see that Satan is trying to lead us, then we need to be able to understand that the devil cannot lead us because of what he has tried to put in us. So he put a disobedience in Adam and Eve and a way to cut them off from God. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to leave them in a perpetual state of disobedience. Isn't that terrible? But that's what the devil will do. That is the devil's plan. He's constantly wanting to cut people off from God. But we've got to stop him right there, right dead in his tracks, so that he will not get away with uh, that experience by trying to, you know, disinherit you from Almighty God. God is good, and he wants you to understand his nature and his character is a good character. The devil is a liar. He is a liar, and he will not get away with what he did, and he will not get away with what he's trying to do in your lives. You know, he wants to keep you in a spiritual dead state. He wants to keep you not knowing God, not knowing who God is, because he wants to be your father. Everybody wants to be your daddy, but I tell you what, you know, I believe the Lord is going to step up to the plate, and he's going to be your daddy. Amen. The Lord is going to be your daddy. Hallelujah. You need to be able to say, Daddy God. Hallelujah. And not let the devil be the one that controls you because he is not the father of your spirit. You don't need to be dead in trespasses and sins. You need to learn to come to Christ, to live. Let's look at Ephesians 2 and 2 again. I want you to understand that, you know, we can have the life that God intends for us to have. You know, he said, you who were dead in trespasses and sins, you can now be made alive in Christ. We can live, or our spirits can live in Christ. Our spirits can live in Christ. You don't have to walk after the course of this world. You don't have to walk after the course of things, the lust for things. The desire for stuff. The devil will try to cause you to lust for the things that are, that are opposing to God. You cannot allow the devil to do that. You who are dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the children of disobedience, among whom you once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body. Now, nobody never did that, I know. Of the mind and the nature, the children of wrath, like the rest of mankind, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, made us live together with Christ. For by grace are you saved, as and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might also show the immeasurable riches of the grace of his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you are saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves or not of your doing, it is the gift of God. It's God's gift. It's God's gift. It's God's gift. And he wants to show you his gift because he wants to give you his spirit. Now, you don't have to do anything to get God's spirit except to receive God through the person of Christ. 
Get rid of the dead spirit. Get rid of the sin. Get rid of the transgressions by disannouncing the death and the dead spirit. Get it out of your life. Say, Satan, you have no part in me. I have no desire for you to control my mortal body or try to keep me cut off from God. I desire to live with Christ. Now, you know, Christ overcame the devil. So let me go to uh, Matthew chapter number four. Let's get some scriptures down in us. Matthew chapter number four. And I want you to see where Christ overcame the devil. Matthew chapter number four. All right, here we go. Now, if you take a look at this chapter, it says, when Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So there you go. Now, the devil wants to tempt Jesus. But he was led to be tempted of the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungered. So his hunger was to help mankind to do the will of God, was to cause man to know that he did not have to have the devil as his father. Cause the devil to be evicted out of the life and the heart of man by putting the word in the life and the heart of man. So let's look at that. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. So basically, the devil, what the devil was saying is, you know, what you're seeing, he said, just by magic, this osmosis, make these hard-hearted children that are following you, just make them children of God. Don't let them go through nothing. Don't let them face anything. Just do it. Just make them children of God. But look at what Jesus said. Jesus said, look, it's not magic that I'm going to do. I didn't come to do that. He said, it's written. He said, listen. He said, Satan, man shall not live by bread alone, but that every word that comes from the mouth of God. So what Jesus told Satan was, the only way that these ones can become sons of God is that they got to hear the word of God. The only way that you're going to change is you've got to hear the word of God. The only way you're going to get out of the devil's clutches is you've got to hear the word of God. Satan will try to deceive you and think that, you know, it's, you know, it's going to be just like so, that, you know, it's going to be like magic. No, there's no magic. There's no osmosis. This is the word of God that's going to do the work of God that's going to cause you to be a part of God's kingdom because of his word. You've got to hear the word of God. You're going to be built up on the Word of God. It is God's Word that will build you up. You've got to hear the Word of God. You've got to hear the Word of God. So automatically right here, you know, I mean, a lot of times I think we think, you know, when we look at the Scripture, we're thinking, we're thinking about physical bread, but actually he's talking about people becoming, you know, disciples, following the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. Make them, just make them, just make them disciples. Just, just, just make them, make them children of God. But he says, look, he said, I want you to understand, devil, it's going to be by the word of God. This is how it's going to happen. God's plan is, is for me to come in and to teach the word. He said, I got to get the word in the people. And if the longer they understand that nothing's going to happen until I give them the word. Everybody that came to Jesus, he gave them the word first before he did a healing for them. Everybody that came to Jesus, he always gave them the word. He didn't just touch them and say, you know, you're done. No, he gave them the word. Be healed. Be delivered. Satan, come out of them. You know? By your faith, you are made whole. He always used the word of God to do the work of God. Every time that a miracle happened, it was because of the word of God. And this is how the plan of God is done. This is how the will of God is done. It's done by the word of God. So you can understand that when you're sitting and you're hearing the word of God and you're getting the word of God in your spirit, you've got to eat the word You've got to hear the word. Satan sits in your ear and try to keep you from hearing the word or the word getting down in your spirit. He wants to knock it out of your ear, but I got news for you. you. You can't allow that to happen. 
you got to allow the word to come down on the inside of you and say, oh, that's mighty good. This is a good word that God has given us that we can understand that we've got to drive Satan away. He sits on one ear or tries to block the word from entering into your heart. You cannot allow him to block the entryway of the word. The word gives light. It gives understanding. It gives peace. It will cause your spirit to be satisfied. It will cause your spirit to be connected with God because after all, God is spirit. And he'll pour his spirit into you because Jesus said it's by the word of God. He said every word that comes out of God's mouth, that's how it's going to happen. That's how it's going to happen. Every word is it's coming out of God's word, God's mouth. That, that's what's going to do it. That's how the kingdom is going to be built on the word of God. And then look at the verse. Now the second thing, the devil still, he, he for some reason, that joker just, under, he just don't give up. He don't know when to quit. And he don't know when to leave you alone. After the first time, he'll try to come back again, just like he does with you. You know, you know, you thought he was gone, then he showed up again in another form. You know, he, he, he'll change forms on you if you're not careful, but you better be aware and be discerning because the spirit of the devil, you know, you've got to know the spirit. The spirit in you is the spirit of Christ, and it will discern the spirit of the devil trying to bring the word to you. Now look, this is the devil talking. The devil took him to a holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. Let the son of the devil kill yourself. Kill yourself. Why? Why should I kill myself, devil? Because God said that if you throw yourself down, that he'll, he'll give his angels charge over you and pick you up. Devil, don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. You know? I mean, why are you going to tempt the Lord? Why are you going to do things that you know are wrong just to see if God will save you and deliver you? Why would you do that? Jesus had the word of God. And he just let him know, look, I know the word of God. Surely, yes, his angels are over me, but I am not going to intentionally do something to see if God's going to come to my rescue or not. And this is where the devil tricks a whole lot of people. Their spirit is at work to try to deceive you out of the word of God. Your spirit, your born again spirit, by now it should be born again because your spirit needed to be born again. He says, look, Ah, I will not be deceived. I will not be deceived. The devil will not tell me what to do. Basically, this is what he's saying. Satan, you're not going to tell me what to do, and I'm not going to follow you. You're not going to lead me. This is how I like to say it. Devil, you're not going to lead me. But for so many of us, he, you know, he still leads us by the hand. Well, come on here, child. You know, you know you're tired of that person messing with you anyway. So, you know, why don't you just go and give up? You know, that, that's, actually, this is a give it up word. You know, the devil gave it up. You know, surrender to the devil, you know. Give up, throw yourself down. You know, just quit on life, you know. You know, just, you know, and some people fall into that trap. And wonder why people give up because the devil and whispered in their ear to give up. And this is what, what basically he's saying to them. Give up. Give up. But Jesus wants you to be aware, to discern that this is the devil trying to take you out. Because God had not discerned and God had not intended for you to be taken out by the devil. He says, look, surely the angels got charge over me. The angels got charge over you. But you don't have to do something stupid and foolish to see whether or not they're there. That basically we want to test the Lord to see if he will respond. If we jump in the water and, you know, don't use the techniques of being able to be safe. You know, if you're swimming, you know you got to follow the techniques uh, that you learn to, in order to swim. But if you jump in the water, you know, they think that you, you know, you're going to make it. And just open your mouth and swallow the water and say, well, if I drown, the Lord will pick me up. No, no, don't do that. Do not do that. Oh, no. Somebody said, well, if I walk on the water, you know, God, God will, you know, he will, He'll, he, he'll save me. And so I'm going to go out there and walk, you know, on the Red Hat River. Don't be a fool. Don't go out there and walk on the Red Hat River. Do not do that. Hallelujah. That's the devil telling you to lose your life. You know, you're trying to tempt the Lord because he wants you to test God to see if you, God will not respond to the devil trying to tempt him and test him. You ought to have discerning enough to know that that's the devil and God is hoping and trusting in you enough to, 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 for you not to do that because God has intended a better plan for you than to be deceived by the devil. Do not step on that water. 
get in the car, drive over it, whatever you need to do, but don't step on that water with your feet and think that the water going to hold you up. That's the devil. When Jesus did this, it was because of a, a need for life to be saved. It wasn't for showmanship. It wasn't to be able to say, you know, look at what I did. And so many times the devil will get people caught up in ego and pride to try to make them think that I am a miracle worker. I did what others have been trying to do. I finally was able to conquer, you know, the element of water, the element of air, the element of the H2O, you know, and the fact that it wasn't ice, but I was able to walk. Don't deceive yourself. There are natural laws that are at work and in place. And God is not going to necessarily, you know, just take away those natural laws just because you want to, you know, show somebody that, you know, you're a Christian. Oh, no. Don't, don't be deceived by the devil's plans. Don't be deceived because God is greater than that. He will not allow the devil to tempt him. He will not allow the devil to lead him. And this is what he's showing the devil. You're not going to lead me. You're not going to tell me what the word says and tell me what I need to do. And that's what he'll try to do. You're not going to do this, devil. You're not going to tell me to jump on the water. You're not going to tell me to go out there and walk, you know, across the Rabbit River. And I hope nobody gets that idea, you know, that, you know, if they do this kind of stuff, you know, that they will be, you know, <laughs> saved. <laughs> But people do that type of thing. They think that, you know, they have to show that God is real. God is real whether or not you believe it. And he doesn't have to prove himself for others to believe him. You know? He doesn't have to prove himself for others to believe him. I'm going to say that again. He doesn't have to prove himself to anybody so that others will believe him. He's real whether you believe him or whether you believe he's real or not. God is real. And not only is he real enough for you to feel him, but he's real enough for you to believe that he is and his word does work. You've got to be able to get a hold of this word and understand that God will do what he said. So here, Jesus defeated him for all of you out there who want to tempt the Lord with the devil's words. And Jesus said, look, tell that deceiver that he's a liar and you don't have to follow him and you don't have to let him lead you by the horn. Or by, or by whatever he leave you on, you know, well, if I do this, the Lord will protect me. You better pray and ask the Lord first, are you supposed to do that? Look, we are being led by the Spirit of God, not by the spirit of lust, the spirit of evil desires, the spirit of temptation. Jesus said, look, devil, you don't tempt me. You don't test me either. So, you know, don't let the devil test you and tempt you. Are you hearing me now? Hallelujah. Don't let the devil tempt you and test you. It's time for us to come past the elementary things because of the elementary things, so many people have lost their lives spiritually. You know, they stopped reading the Bible because they felt like I have arrived here. And the devil have told them, you know, that you know, they don't have to, you know, follow the course of the Word of God. Yes, you do. You cannot give up on this Word. As long as you are in this body, as long as your spirit is in this body, then you have to follow the Word of God. You must follow the Word of God. This body might be rebellious, but the spirit in you is not rebellious because Christ is not rebelling against himself. So you have to be able to follow this Word. You must flow with this Word. You must flow into this Word because the Spirit of God flows. That's how he works. He flows. You know, it's like how, you know, you can feel the water flowing. You know, if you ever get under the water, the water flows. It flows smoothly. You know, it's a current that goes in the water. And it's a current that flows with your spirit. And he has a current that you have to follow. A wonderful, wonderful flow. That if you can follow, do not resist the Spirit of God. Because if you resist Him, then you are missing His plan. Do not resist Him. Learn to acknowledge God's Spirit. Allow your spirit on the inside of you, enough word in you to build you up enough where you can flow with God. When He comes in, He wants you to flow with Him. Don't go against the grain, but follow what Christ is saying by his word. The spirit of Christ overcomes the law of sin and death. And this is the law that we're going to use today 
Amen. That the Spirit of Christ overcomes the law of sin and death. This is in the book of Romans. The Spirit of Christ overcomes the law of sin and death. That means that you don't have to obey the devil. You don't have to follow the devil. You don't have to let him lead you. You don't have to let him cause you to be able to make a mistake and never think you can recover. If you made a mistake, you can recover. God wants you to know that you don't have to be locked into mistakes. Come on now. Somebody out there is going through something where, you know, you're just, you know, going through mistakes and, you know, you're just, the devil won't let you away from that guilt. But I'll tell you one thing. According to the Bible, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The spirit of Christ that is resident on the inside of you, that has caused your spirit to, to be born again, will follow the spirit of Christ. So when you follow his spirit, you will not have to feel like you got to, you know, be so guilty about things. God has not given you a guilt complex. Here, we're looking at the second, second enticement that the devil tried to do with Jesus. He wanted Jesus to have a guilt complex because of what the word says. And you know, you've got to shake that devil loose. Shake him off of you. Shake him free from you. Shake, 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 shake the devil off. Hallelujah, because he is going to try his best to hold on to you and ride you like a monkey right your back if you don't get him up out of your life. And I tell you, today is about time now to get him up out of your life. You know, bail on him, throw him out, throw him off of your back, throw him off of your heart, throw him off of your mind. Get him out of you, get him out, get a brand new mind. Get the mind of Christ through the spirit of Christ. Let his mind be in you. The same mind that was in Christ can also be in you. The same mind that Christ had about how to deal with the devil will be on the inside of you. Follow the mind of Christ because it is, it is the word of God that's going to rescue you. It's his word, his plan that's going to cause you to be free from sin. That you don't have to be dead or you can be alive. Your spirit can be quickened. Your spirit can have life. The quickening of God's spirit, the life of his spirit will be on the inside of you. Christ overcame the devil just for you and for me as well. He overcame the devil so that the devil will not be able to do any harm to him. But God quickened him. The spirit that is in you can be quickened by God's spirit. That means the life that God wants you to have can be deposited in you. On oh, last week, I talked about the things that I have not seen, you have not heard, or nor have entered into your heart. Or there are many victories that maybe had not even entered into your heart. Things that you think probably God wasn't concerned for. Well, it hasn't entered into your heart because the devil may have tried to block it. Trying to keep you uh, in a hardness from you seeing, you know, that this is uh, not God's plan for you to block God out. Well, get free. Get that shield off of your heart. Get that unbelief out of your heart. Because God wants to show you how much he loves you and how much he cares for you by breaking that shield. Let those chains fall off of you. Let that shield of darkness come away from you because after all, God wants to show you his love and he's already done that when he sent Jesus to give him his life. And it's about time that we receive the life of Christ because it's the life of Christ that gives us victory. When someone dies for you, that's a great honor. That's a great blessing. Christ has died for not only you, but for me, and for all mankind, and for those who have yet been born, he's already died for them. So now look at the word of God. And, and so look at what Jesus said. He said, uh, it's written. It's written. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. That's all I'm saying here. The same thing Jesus said. It's written, don't test the Lord. You don't have to prove nothing. God is the prover. If you said his word will work, his word will work. If you say I'm healed, he's the healer. If you said he revealed himself to me, he is the revealer. You're not the revealer. You have to wait till he turns the light on or shows himself to you so you can see. You know, the Bible says, 
and it says those who are whose spirits are born again uh, they can see the kingdom of God you can't see anything until your spirit is born again read John 3 3 you will see it he says when you are born again you can see the kingdom of God and you're wondering why you can't see anything well you know it hasn't entered into your heart yet you've got to receive Christ you've got to receive him into your heart he says to take me into your heart I have not seen neither have ear here heard neither have it entered into the heart of man the things that God had prepared for them well God's prepared great things for you but you've got to let it come in you've got to let it come in you've got to let it come in the things that he has prepared for you are the things that he wants to give you freely he wants to freely give you so don't let the devil test you again the devil took him to a, a high mountain and showed him so the devil still didn't give up all the kingdoms of the world now now and, and this is how so many of us look at it so how can the devil show him something that's not his but but the devil you know said he showed him the kingdoms of the world and their glory you know the lust kingdom you know the evil kingdom you know the the kingdom of envy the kingdom the the stuff that uh, and the devil is, is kind of setting out over in, in so many words. And he said to him, all these things I'll give you. Lord have mercy. How can he give the, the Son of God? How can he give the Creator? How can he give him the kingdoms of the world? How can he give him what's already here? The Bible says the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. He sits on the universe. He sits on the earth. He sits everywhere. He's everywhere. How can the devil give him the kingdoms when he is the king? Jesus himself is the king. So how can the devil give him the kingdom? So that was the statement right there. You know, I'm going to give you the kingdom. How can the devil give you anything? Anything the devil give, you know, it's got some strings attached to it. You better watch out. If he give you something, you better watch out. You better look out and look around you to the left, to the right, behind you, in front of you, all around you. You better do a 360 and turn around and do a 360 on top of 360 because the devil got a way of trying to come back for what's his. But Jesus said... He has nothing in me. You got to learn that. Amen. You got to learn that. He has nothing in me. And he's got nothing in you because he can't give you nothing. You know, he can't give you a healing. He can't give you a deliverance. And he can't give you the best thing in your life. And he can't give you salvation. That's one thing he can't give you. Salvation. Jesus can, though. Jesus can give you salvation. But the devil cannot give you salvation. He can't save you. He can't save you. So how in the world can he give you anything? Nothing that is of any value. Nothing that will last. He said, I'll give you everything. And here's what Jesus said. Be gone. Be gone. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him shall you serve. Isn't that something? Be gone, Satan. Look. Satan wanted worship. That's the bottom line. He wanted worship. He said, oh, if you bow down to Jesus and worship me, I'll give you everything. And you know, that is basically what the devil wants from people. And I don't mean no harm, but some men have certain things that they worship. And I guess some women do also. I don't want to use gender, but I'm telling you, some people, they're like, oh, if I could get that. Oh, if I could have that. Oh, and they go into an adoration deeper than they do for the adoration of God, deeper than they do for a relationship with God. They have really placed this image above God. When God said, have no other image before me, but people will create images. I'm talking about spiritual now, spirits, spirits, they will create images. And our image is spiritual. And they make this image above the spirit of God. And when he said, have no other gods before me, and that's the word of God, he says, look, don't worship anything. Only worship God. And only serve God. And the Bible says the devil left him. When he found out that he couldn't get no worship. Is you, are you giving up your worship to the devil? Are you worshiping the creature or the creator? Which one are you worshiping? The creature? You know, some people worship the creature. You know? Some women worship men, some men worship women, you know, some men worship cars, 
Some men worship money. You know, there are all kinds of things that people worship. I'm just naming a few things that people worship. And you're saying, oh, no. Well, you do have to understand worship. Worship is like adoration, as I said earlier. You adore or adorn something higher than you adore or adorn the presence of God. You spend more time with it, and you're more intimate with it than you are with God. When you're more intimate with a thing than you are with God, that becomes your image. That becomes your, <laughs> your, your relationship. You, know, you build up your know, relationship you know, on that thing. So you know, you've got to be so careful and so mindful of your relationship with Christ. How much time do you spend with Him? How much time do you spend in your relationship with Him? Uh, your spirit, and that is born again, is your spirit able to flow with God? When God's speaking, will your spirit connect with Him? Will your spirit that's born again connect with Him? Do you spend enough time with God to connect with Him? Or do you spend more time with the other things that the human flesh wants? Well, allow the spirit part of you the freedom to develop a spiritual connection because we need to be connected in a relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. Our spirit needs to be nurtured. Our spirit needs to be fed. Of course, the body is going to be fed. We're going to take care of the body. But we're not taking care of the spirit. We're not developing our spirit. We're not taking time to feed our spirit the word of God spiritually. You know, we might be taking time, you know, to, you know, spend time, you know, with the natural things, feed the body, prep the body, but the spirit wants the word. You have to get in the spirit, spend enough time until your body is no longer present, but spiritually, your spirit is present. And when you read this Bible, the words will open up to you when you are spiritually awakened or alert or discerning or your body is no longer in charge of your life but your spirit is in charge with the aid of God's spirit the spirit of Christ the Holy Spirit when the spirit is in charge of you you have a more fulfilled complete life Satan has no place in you he he can't drop little tokens in you you know, little things in you that, you know, you're like, oh, I wish I had that. This, things of this world will not have more value to you than the things of God. But, you know, when the body's in control, the things of this world has more value than the things of God. And that's not how God intended. God did not intend for the things of this world to rule you. We ought to have dominion over the things of this world. And when we are able to access the spiritual realm, then we'll be able to understand there's a more fulfilling. We can feel more fulfilled and more comfortable and more concrete because there are more substance in the words of Christ. The words are spiritual. When we say spiritual and our spirit says spirit, they can connect because the spirit can connect. You can't see the spirit. But you can now know it's there and discern it's there and you can feel and sense by the Spirit of Christ that God has connected with you. You don't have to see him to believe he is. And that's what he wants us to get to. You've got to be able to connect with him in a way that he understands that you believe what he says, whether you can see it or not. The sense realm wants you to see everything before you believe it. The spirit realm says believe it before you see it. That's what it was said to Thomas. Blessed are those who, who have not seen, but believe. We're among those. You know, if we haven't seen the physical presence of the Lord, but if we can believe, what well, fortunate. Can you believe what he says when you read the words in the Bible, though you can't see words, you can't see spirit? unless he opened your eyes to see spirit. Noah, the spirit realm, is a realm that your heart needs to be opened up to. Your eyes, he said, however, those who are born of the kingdom, those who are born can see the kingdom. They can see the kingdom. They can see 
the things of God. They can see the righteousness. They can see the blessings of God when you're born again. Maybe you need to be born again so you can set your priorities in order today. Begin to prioritize your life and understand that spiritual things are first and then natural things. Some of us have put natural things prior to spiritual things. That's what's wrong. That's why your lives are in array and topsy-turvy and upside down is because you got the wrong order. And I want you to get the order straight today. Straighten the order out. The order needs to be changed. Reverse the order. Let the order be spiritual, then natural. Your spirit has a body, you've got a soul. Hallelujah. So we need to understand, yes, the spiritual things come first. So if we seek God first, then he's first in our lives. But if we seek the natural things first, if we think about eating, when we first get up and sit down and take care of the natural man before we take care of the spiritual man, then that's the wrong priority. And I'm not saying don't take care of the spiritual man. You do. But you've got to put the spiritual man first. Look first for the spiritual things. And then the natural things will sometimes not be so difficult. They'll go smoother. When you set things in order in the, in the realm of the spirit, you set your day in order, I guarantee you things will be so much smoother. It's just the way that God does things. When you put in verse, he'll take care of your natural stuff. If you just remember that he loves you, he takes care of you, but he's first. He's first. He's first. His glory, he doesn't have to share with another, but he is first. He's a jealous God. That's what the word says. And he is spirit. And if you don't do this, the devil is right there on the other side trying his best to deceive you, to get you away from God because he wants you for himself. Well, back the devil down. Back the devil down. Let him know that he can't have you and he can't put sickness in you. He can't put disease in you. He can't <coughs> put problems in you. Don't you know it's time now for you to have erased all your problems through the aid of the Holy Spirit, through him quickening you and telling you how to handle stuff? That God will show you how to handle things in an expedient way and you don't have to spend five hours to solve a problem and it only take three seconds. But if you put your natural self first, I'm telling you, it'll take sometimes five hours to solve a little simple task that God can solve in three seconds. So which one do you choose, A or B? Well, it's time now for us to choose God, amen. To choose him and choose his plan. Choose his plan. Choose his plan. This word is so powerful that the devil don't want you to have it. That's why he tries to block your heart. Block the entryway to your heart. Do not allow the entryway to be blocked. Say, oh God, help me to receive you and to receive your word. This is eternal life. This word is eternal life. This word is your life. It's your life. This is what you've been waiting for all of your life. You think you've been waiting for something else, but no, you've been waiting for this word. Well, with Adam, Christ came to take care of that. Yes, he did. He said the first Adam will fail, but the second Adam came as a quickening spirit. And that quickening spirit is named Jesus. So I'm telling you today that this Jesus that we serve is awesome, is powerful. And he's able to do for you the things that need to be done. If I could just pour it into you. But it's the Holy Spirit. And you know, he's a pourer. That's what he is. He said, I will pour into you. So will you allow him to pour into you? Will you open up yourself to the Lord's pouring state? So if he will pour into you, can you receive the pouring or the outpouring of his spirit? Receive him as he pours out into you. I know there's somebody out there now I really discern that you know you're you're going through something. I feel some pains right across the, your chest and across your back. God's healing you right now. God's healing you right now. There's a heavy weightness on you that, and God is breaking you free from that heavy weight in the name of Jesus. Yes. Yes. There's some things that are being 
being shifted in your life. God's taking care of you. Yes, he's taking care of you. He's loving you. This teaching on spirit to spirit, you know, come on down, you know, and be in the assembly where the teaching is going on so you can be in touch with the flow of the spirit. See, a lot of times people say, well, you know, uh, well, he can do this. Yes, he can. But when the spirit is flowing and where he's flowing, he can flow anywhere, but where he's flowing is better to be in the presence. You know, when Jesus was walking and the spirit was flowing and the spirit would flow into others, there would be healing. And there were others who were up on the hill. They didn't get that same thing because they were not right there where he was. They weren't with the flow. And sometimes we got to be close enough to Jesus where we can get in the flow. Well, come on now and get in the flow and let the spirit touch you. Let him touch your spirit so you can be free. I really feel God, you know, begin to do a work for you right now. Come on now, amen. 149 Quinn Street, amen. And we love you. We'll do you good. We'll treat you right. Amen. And that is to show you the love of Christ. God bless you, and I hope you have a good week and have a blessed, 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 wonderful day. May God's blessing be with you is my prayer. Amen. Amen. 149 Queen Street. Yes. Amen. All right, all right. This is the place that God will have you. Amen. Friends of God, Worship Center, come on down and join with us. We'd love to have you. Love to be able to love on you, hug you, make you feel real good, make you feel comfortable, cause your spirit to be connected with God's spirit. That's all we want to do is get you connected. How about that? We love you so. Amen. Let me have a prayer with you. Father, for those who watch this broadcast today, I pray that your Holy Spirit would touch them right now, that they would know you in the pardon of their sins and know you as the one who flows into them and gives them the brand new life, the life of Christ. Thank you, Father, that the Spirit of Christ will come into their life and they'll be joined with him and they'll become a part of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, God. Bless them all and keep them and make them strong. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. God bless you all. Be looking, you know. Uh, God bless you. Just be with you. Amen. Come on down. Amen. We'll pray for you. God bless you. Amen.